a number of semesters since then. Uh, I don't, uh, not this semester, didn't have students for the class, but we just had a good round last spring and, and I really enjoyed teaching. Um, um, it's kind of odd this semester. I only have one of my children in college, taking college class after years of, since 2000, 10 years we've had kids in college. And this, this year it's just our oldest son who teaches English over in the Middle East and he's taking classes by extension to work on another bachelor's. And that's the only one of my kids in college this year. Anyway, they'll come back. <laughs> and, uh, there's some younger ones yet, some of them are finished. But anyway, um, while I'm here, uh, I will give a shameless plug, a, a prayer request, please. If you'll pray for Eureka Bible Church. Uh, we are uh, we are starting on Sunday evening, by faith, uh, a 10-week depression study group. I never came up with a better name for it than that. Um, but uh, I was just challenged by my students here at Brooks last spring. Uh, you know, what are you doing to reach your community? Because we asked them that, you know, what are you guys doing in your churches? And they looked at me and said, what do you do in your church? <laughs> well, you know, we open the doors on Sunday morning, you know, people are just supposed to come. And uh, anyway, just thinking through that, uh, I decided I came up, I, I have ideas, but I don't always carry them through. And this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry this one through. So, uh, Eureka Days, the annual whatever parade and whatnot is uh, tomorrow. Friday and Saturday, and so we're going to have a booth. We're going to give out information. We're going to we're going to apply biblical counseling to depression. The statistics are mind-boggling. The depression today, uh, suicide, the number of people that are on meds for stuff is just mind-boggling. Uh, especially, I know I know all you students are trying to get your college. You're trying to figure out how you're going to pay your bill, right? But honestly, we live in probably about the best time financially. Our prosperity is about as high as it's ever been in Earth history. And yet, we have more depression. Um, the numbers just keep going up and up and up. And I've been just, just scanning the internet you know, for articles about these things. And a week ago, I came across an article. Fish brains in the Niagara Riverway are showing increased signs of antidepressant medications. So when they when they harvest fish out of the river that flows from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, and then when the scientists investigate fish brains, they find that they find them loaded with antidepressants mm. because people take them, the body processes them, and they go out in the sewer system, and it goes into God's water supply, and the fish live there. And the fish are, I don't know if they're happy or not, but uh, they're having abnormal high levels of serotonin inhibitors or whatever, what SSRIs and so on. But anyway, at least they're, they're not depressed. <laughs> I don't know. If you got taken out of the water and your brain investigated, maybe you'd be depressed too. But uh, anyway, so uh, we just appreciate your prayers. It's one of the ways we're going to try to reach out to our community. And it, uh, we're going to work our way through Ed Welch's book, uh, Depression Up from the Stubborn Darkness, uh, but it's going to be biblical counseling in a small group setting. It's not group therapy. It is not group therapy. It's, uh, it's small group discipleship. And we appreciate your prayers. I hope to have some good news to tell you. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to be looking this morning in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. And... Uh, uh, when I came up here uh, on the piano is the Solid Rock. Oh, that's the song I was going to pick for today. And then Austin got up to read scripture, and he says, First Peter. I said, Oh, how did they know? But he was in the first chapter, and I was in the second chapter. But anyway, very, very, very close. I want to look in uh, Zechariah chapter 12 this morning, and I'm going to focus on verse 3. I'm going to focus on verse 3. Zechariah 12 and verse 3, and in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Uh, the idea of the stone in the scripture is a, a rich uh, metaphor, description of God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help 
in trouble. We could have sung, a mighty fortress is, is our God this morning. Uh, we have the picture of uh, God laying in Zion, a precious cornerstone. Uh, Jesus, of course, is the cornerstone. And upon Christ, all who come to him are built up as living stones into a spiritual house. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, Christ is the foundation, but the rock that serves as a foundation can also be a cause of stumbling, a cause of crushing. And uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verses uh, 13, 14, and 15 tell us that, and other scriptures as well. Isaiah chapter 8. Sometimes turning to a page in the Bible is kind of like the way we play golf. You ever hit the ball past the hole, so then you, you hit it past the other way, and then you hit it past. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm in Isaiah chapter 8. I'm here now. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel, for a trap, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. So the rock that is on one hand, a rock of deliverance, a rock of safety, and a shelter in the time of storm, an anchor, that rock can also be a rock of crushing and stumbling, and you're reminded of the words of Christ when he said in Matthew 21, verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And, and, and we understand when Jesus says there, whoever, this, whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. We, we believe Jesus is talking there about those of us who will come to him humbly, uh, mourning for our sins, uh, come in brokenness. We come, uh, we come bowing, humbling ourselves before Him. And when we do that, then uh, we're, we're broken, but we're delivered. We're saved. And those, so those who will come before Him broken are delivered. But those who come before Him unbroken will be broken. So here we have this statement in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3 that I want to dig into a little bit further. Let me, uh, so, uh, so we go to a quarter after, is that correct? Ish? Class starts, class resumes? Yes, sir. Class resumes, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to shoot for a quarter after. All right. Um, the book of Zechariah, uh, I don't know why we don't hear more preaching from it. Uh, last time I read, uh, last year as I was reading through it, I said, well, why do we always turn to the book of Daniel? Well, because Daniel's good, right? But Zechariah is loaded with end time, eschatological information, and especially some of the clearest prophecies of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Behold, your king comes, gentle, lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, full of the donkey. That's in Zechariah. Uh, they priced him at 30 pieces of silver which they threw to the potter in the house of the Lord. That's in Zechariah. Uh, they will look on him who may have pierced. That's in Zechariah. Uh, strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And, and, and so in Zechariah, there's just these, these references over and over again to the coming Messiah, and clearly predicts how he's going to come, he's going to be rejected, but then he comes again. In chapter 14 and verse 9, and the Lord shall be king. So wonderful, wonderful uh, prophecies looking ahead to the end time and to the reign of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, by the way, he thinks that a lot of people ignore the book because if you don't believe in a literal future millennium, you don't know what to do with it. And if you do believe in it, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. In the first six chapters, Zechariah has about eight apocalyptic visions in which the Lord tells, the, communicates to these these bedraggled uh, exiles. They've come back from the Babylonian captivity. They, they came back and they, they tried to build the temple and then they were opposed and then they had to, the, uh, Haggai and Zechariah the prophets had to get them stirred up again and they went back to work on it and they, and they built that and then Ezra came along and Nehemiah came along and they built the walls but there's just a handful of people and, and, uh, and they're still, you know, Persian. The Persian Empire has their, uh, has their control over them and, and it had to be kind of 
challenging and dark days. What what is the Lord doing? And, and are, are we going to be a nation again? And 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 the people. And you see this uh, as you study uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, they weren't all just all sold out for the Lord, were they? They were looking for how can I how can I personally benefit from this? How can I make money? How can I I build my cedar house? But uh, the temple went all that someday. Um, so they 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 were having some. They were back in the land. But they weren't back in step with the Lord. In chapter 7 and 8 in Zechariah, uh, should we keep on fasting like we, we used to fast so that you know this would happen and now it's happened? Should we keep on fasting? And, and the Lord answers them with some questions and, and uh, then tells them, here's what I'm going to bring in the future. And then in chapters 9, 10, and 11, there's an oracle, a burden, uh, that begins with judgment against the enemies. Judgment against the enemies. But you know... If God is judge, he is just to judge his people as well, isn't he? And so chapter 9 starts out judging Damascus, but then, you know, your king comes to you and uh, comes as a shepherd, and the shepherd's rejected in chapter 11. Uh, and then Zechariah has another oracle, another bird, in chapter 12, 13, and 14, in which uh, the shepherd king comes back. He comes back. And he uh, he becomes king over all, and in it's in this uh, it's in this second oracle, probably given later in the life of Zechariah. We think that because uh, I don't remember exactly where, but in uh, one of these later chapters, there's reference to Greece. And so the Babylonian Empire had risen to power, and then they slipped off, and the Medo-Persian Empire came to power. And under the Medo-Persian Empire, the people were able to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, rebuild the city. But then what happened to the Persian Empire? Then along comes Alexander the Great. You get all this in world history, right? In Western civilization, you, you get all this in that class. But So Zechariah is writing in these days when the, when the Jewish people are back in the land and the world powers, uh, the things that Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar saw in their dreams and visions, the world powers are kind of being unsettled. And Zechariah is given a message in which he sees further into the future. And in chapter 12 and verse 3, uh, the Lord says, in that day, which is uh, a very key phrase throughout chapter 12 and on into chapter 13 and 14, in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. The Lord gives through Zechariah here a message that those who oppose God, His work, His people, His holy city, they will only injure themselves. Let's, uh, let's for a few moments, notice here, first of all, the totality of rejection. The totality of rejection. Uh, verse 3 mentions uh, it's a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And if we back up to verse 2, uh, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Chapter 14 of Zechariah. Chapter 14. And verse 2 and 3. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, etc. Uh, we see in these verses, and we'll look at a few others, uh, I'm going to turn to the book of Micah, uh, that God gathers the nations against his people. It's, it's everybody. It's everybody. Uh, Micah chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, Now also many nations are gathered against thee, that say, Let her be defiled. Let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy host brass. Thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole, her, whole earth. The nations gather together against God's work, God's people, God's city, and God tells his people, rise up and thresh them with uh, with feet and horns of iron. The book of Joel. The book of Joel. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 and verse 2. 
I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat means? Jehovah is Shaphat. He's the judge. He's the judge. Jehovah is the judge. The Lord judges. And God says, gather all the people. Bring them all together. I'm going to gather them. I'm going to judge them there. We could look ahead in the book of Revelation, chapter 16 and verse 14. The evil spirits gather the kings of the earth together against the Lord. <clears throat> Revelation 19 and verse 19. The beast and the kings of the earth gather their armies against him who rides on the horse with the sword coming out of his mouth. Who's going to win that battle? The one who's on the horse, right? Our Lord and Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords. He will and does win that battle. And then after the millennium in Revelation 20, verses 8 through 9, Satan is loose for a little while, and what does he do? He gathers everyone willing, and they surround the camp of the Lord's people. And I love, uh, you know, sometimes I love that the Bible doesn't give us much detail. It just says, uh, well, what does it say? Um, fire came down from heaven and devoured them. <laughs> you know, it's not, well, they flanked around this way, and then they went this way, and then, they, you know, it's just poof. It's just poof, because that's all God has to do is say poof, and, uh, and they're poof. So you see the totality of rejection, all the nations, they come, and, and, and uh, you know now the kings of the earth can't get their act together for two minutes. And... Maybe we should be thankful for that. You know, what, what happened to the League of Nations? Uh, what happens in the United Nations? They, they can't agree on, they can't work together for, but someday, and I believe especially related to Antichrist, uh, Antichrist is going to have some charismatic power by which he's able to get everyone to, hey, let's all get together and oppose this people, this work, this city. Uh, but they do not rule the day. They do not rule the day. God does. You see, the, you see the totality of rejection. But you also see here the futility of rejection. And we see in verse 3 that all of these ones come together against Jerusalem. And what happens to them? Jerusalem is a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Uh, a burdensome stone. Uh, a, a weighty object that just loads people down. And the word burdensome, it's talking of a burden. It's the kind of thing that you would uh, you would load your donkeys with a burden, with uh, uh, so much a burden of earth or a burden of wheat or whatever. You would load your donkeys. You would, uh, you would use a yoke. People would use a yoke to carry their heavy burdens. Uh, so a burden is something that, that, that weighs you down, that, that, uh, that is, is heavy. And interesting, the word is used in Psalm 68, verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, the God of our salvation. And God does that, doesn't he? He loads us down. Well, here, Jerusalem is made a heavy weight, a stone that weighs people down. And it says here that those who burden themselves with it will be cut in pieces. The word cut, uh, lacerated, uh, scratched, but deeper than that, gashed, cut. The word is used uh, in, in the Old Testament in the, in the law when uh, Moses told the people, God told the people through Moses uh, not to cut yourself. Don't cut yourself. And referring, no doubt, to the heathen practice, we see it. It's a different word, but uh, when, when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal, call on your God. And it's a different word that's used there, but they cry out to their God and they, they're, they're dancing around and they cut themselves. And, and Jeremiah uh, 16 and 41 and 47 speak of this practice as well. Again, it's a different word, but uh, seem to be speaking of this practice where the heathen would try to, try to summon their God by cutting themselves. And here, this word is used. Uh, these people are going to come and they'll be cut, lacerated, gashed by this. And interestingly, this is one of these places in the, in the Hebrew where the word is doubled up, where they will cut themselves with cuts. They will uh, lacerate themselves with lacerations. It's doubled up uh, in order to intensify the meaning. 
to, uh, well, let's double up the meaning, to say it really strongly. And, and it, it, it comes across in your English translation, uh, for example, the King James says they'll, they'll be cut in pieces. Well, the, the Hebrew doesn't say in pieces. It says they'll be cut with cuts. Mm. They'll, they'll rip themselves up. And, um, and I, I know you carry some different translations here, but let me read some of these ones um, that I came across. Uh, New living on that day, I'll make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. Mm. And that's the idea here. They'll only hurt themselves. The English standard, all who lift it will surely hurt themselves. And they take it there, uh, the doubling up of the word as a, a certainty. Uh, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt yourself. Uh, the, the, the CSB, uh, all who try to lift it will injure themselves severely. New American Standard, all who lift it will be severely injured. Uh, Darby, all that burden themselves with it shall certainly be wounded. You get the idea. Uh, those who try to kick against the stone, who gets hurt? Mm. Does the stone get hurt? Mm. The stone isn't, the stone's not hurt by it. But those who kick the stone, uh, an interesting story is told by Jerome. Jerome was uh, a leader in the church about the year 400, and uh, he was commissioned with uh, collecting the different translate the Latin and, and standardizing it. Uh, there's more to the story than that, but basically the, the Latin Bible that was uh, in use for centuries, Jerome took the various ones and made a standard uh, standard. Anyway, Jerome, in his notes here on Zechariah 12, he makes he, he tells about a common practice in Palestine and throughout Judea, and I think that the Middle East at that time, and maybe still to this day in a different way, but uh, uh, Jerome tells about uh, the young men who were ambitious to show how strong they were. They would lift rocks. Mm -hmm. And often outside the city or some common place around town, there'd be some rocks, and the guys would, yeah, let me show you how big I can, you know, and they would lift it up, uh, they would, they would, they would, you know, I can lift it up to my knees, well, I can lift it to my belly button, well, I can lift it here, and I can lift it here, and, and, uh, well, you can just imagine what happens when people lifting rocks above their head. Somebody's going to get hurt, right? Yes, somebody's, somebody's going to get hurt, and Jerome, uh, Jerome refers to that uh, in this, uh, in connection with Zechariah 12 and verse 3. You know, you start trying to lift heavy rocks, you're going to get hurt. I, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Uh, cows can be ornery. People can be ornery. Sometimes uh, young farmers and farm and so on would be known to punch a cow. 1,500-pound mm. cow, you know. Almost every year, some guy in high school had a cast on his wrist. <laughs> oh, yeah, what happened to you? Yeah, I punched a cow. Um, wow. I never broke my wrist, by the way. I have a chip tooth, but I didn't. But I, didn't. Uh, I just uh, I met one of our new neighbors uh, the other day. Um, we just moved into Eureka, and um, he was telling me about another neighbor who's trying to grow the perfect lawn. Trying mm -hmm. to grow the perfect lawn. And also the perfect shade trees. Mm -hmm. You can have shade or you can have lawn, you know. And, and he said his neighbor's always out there. He's always, he's always fighting. He's, and, and then he, he made this, uh, he, he said he's always, 